Imagine stepping out of your spacecraft and setting foot on the surface of the moon. Under your feet, the ground is covered with a fine material that looks like powder. That's lunar dust. You look around and take a lungful of fresh air. It smells very different from the air on Earth, but still nice. Now, unfortunately, this is a highly unlikely scenario. And one of the reasons is that the moon has almost no atmosphere. Earth's natural satellite is too small, less than 2% of our planet's mass. That's why it doesn't have a magnetic field strong enough to keep an atmosphere. But even if the moon had it, solar winds would immediately pull it away. But if you could visit the moon 3 or 4 billion years ago, oh, you'd see a very different picture. At that time, the moon most likely had an atmosphere. It formed at the times when powerful volcanic eruptions were rocking the satellite. Gases spread all over the moon's surface. It happened so fast that they didn't have enough time to escape into space. At that time, the lunar surface was covered with basins filled with volcanic basalt. Just imagine, ginormous plumes of magma hurling high into the air, falling to the ground, forming lava flows. That's how the basalt basins appeared on the surface of the moon. At one point, scientists on Earth got their hands on samples brought from the moon. They found out that lava flows there contained not only carbon monoxide and sulfur, but also the building blocks of water. Thanks to these samples, researchers managed to calculate the amount of gas that rose and formed the atmosphere. It became the thickest around 3.5 billion years ago and existed for about 70 million years. After that, poof, the atmosphere was lost in space. But the coolest thing? When the moon did have an atmosphere, the satellite was 3 to 10 times closer to our planet. One computer simulation even suggested the moon was probably up to 19 times closer than it is now. The distance between it and our planet could be 18,600 miles. Well, these days, it's around 240,000 miles. That's why the moon looked much, much bigger in the sky. Unfortunately, at that time, not even dinos were around to admire the view. Hm, neither was I. At the same time, the most recent studies have confirmed that our moon actually does have an atmosphere. It's composed mostly of hydrogen, neon, and argon, and contains some very unusual gases, like potassium and sodium. You can't find them in, let's say, the atmospheres of Mars, Venus, or Earth, Sadly, such an atmosphere isn't suitable for us oxygen-dependent creatures. But guess what? There's loads of oxygen on the moon. Nah, I know, it must sound confusing. But the thing is, this oxygen isn't in its most common gaseous form. Nah, it's trapped in a layer of rock and dust covering the surface of the moon. This layer is called the regolith, and it contains up to 45% oxygen. So, does it mean that if people learned how to extract this oxygen, we would be able to live on the moon? Eh, not so fast. The oxygen in those rocks is very tightly bound into the minerals. And to break these components apart, we'd need tons of energy and special equipment. But if people managed to start this process, the moon would deliver quite a lot of oxygen. Now, there's a theory that the moon might have been formed during a collision between Earth and another planet. This planet must have been smaller, the size of Mars. It probably happened around 4.5 billion years ago. Another theory claims that the moon used to be an asteroid or some other wandering body. It formed somewhere else in the solar system. When it was passing by Earth, it got caught by our planet's gravity. Other experts think that at some point in the past, Earth was spinning so fast that some of its material broke away. It soon started to orbit our planet, and that's how the moon appeared in the sky. And the least exciting theory claims that Earth's natural satellite could simply appear along with Earth during our planet's formation. These days, the moon is the fifth largest natural satellite in our solar system. It's also one of the densest, second only to Jupiter's satellite Io. Most likely, the Moon has a tiny core, no bigger than 2% of the satellite's mass. About 420 miles wide, it consists mostly of iron and sulfur. The Moon's surface is dark, even though Earth's natural satellite is the brightest object in the night sky. But in reality, its reflectance is just a bit higher than that of asphalt. You might have heard that the Moon, along with the Sun, causes tides in the oceans and seas on Earth. 
The satellite's gravitational pull creates something called the tidal force. It makes the water bulge out on the sides that are the closest to the moon and farthest from the satellite. These bulges are what we know as high tides. Look up! Find that little yellow dot. That's Titan. It's Saturn's largest moon, and the second largest moon in our whole solar system. And it might be the only place in our solar system where there's liquid water, besides Earth. Plus, it has an atmosphere that serves as a shield against solar radiation and cosmic rays, just like Earth. If life was a house, Titan would have a lot of the bricks you'd need to build it. Strap in, you're heading over there. It takes a long time to get to Titan, but you know, the magic of YouTube. Here it is, a bit bigger than our moon and a whole lot heavier. It's even bigger than Mercury. That means its gravity is still pretty weak. You'll feel seven times lighter here than on Earth. At the local gym back home, you can lift 150 pounds. On Titan, you can lift more than 1,000. Ha, looking good. The surface is mostly made up of ice. It has small mountains, craters, and a few cryovolcanoes. Basically, the same as a regular volcano. But instead of lava, this beast spits out water, ice, ammonia, and methane. There are lakes and clouds, kind of like a canyon would look like on Earth. But here, there's only a tiny difference. Everything is covered in thick fog, and sometimes it hails frozen methane. On Earth, we use methane as fuel because it burns. But on Titan, there's no oxygen. Can't get a fire going on this hunk of rock. No oxygen means you need to put on an oxygen mask, but you don't have to wear a whole spacesuit like on our moon. Titan has a stronger atmosphere, but you packed a sweatshirt, right? It's gonna get pretty cold soon, like negative 300 degrees cold. The coldest it ever got on Earth was negative 128, and that was right at the South Pole. It's so cold because it's so far from the sun, almost 900 million miles. Anyway, that dense fog and atmosphere stop the sun's rays from warming the surface. Sounds kind of extreme, but so is life. It can survive almost anywhere. Take the bacteria, de no, some long Latin word. It can survive radiation and extremely low temperatures. It even survived a whole year in outer space on the outside of the International Space Station. Titan would be a piece of cake compared to that, especially if we drilled down a bit. Many scientists believe there's a whole ocean under the surface of Titan. Saturn's gravity gives Titan's core a little heat boost. Plus, there's ammonia in that ocean. It's like Titan's version of antifreeze. As long as the water stays liquid, life's got a pretty strong chance of success. So what's down there? Scientists have actually found real evidence that Titan might already have life on it. Here, check out this microscope. This is C3H2. It was discovered by this weird group of antenna things living in the desert in Chile. It used 66 antennas, all pointed at the same place in the sky. This C3H2 molecule can act as a building block for DNA, the code of life. Some people think that these molecules were around on our planet billions of years ago, just when life began. Scientists also checked it out firsthand with a probe that actually landed on Titan. Turns out those desert antenna things were right. Titan shot to the top of the list of places we could one day live on. Sorry, Mars. NASA has a new project, the Dragonfly mission. They're gonna send a drone out there and explore Titan even more. The mission's still about six years away and the rocket will reach Saturn's moon nine years after that. So we're gonna have to wait a while before we pack up and move to Titan. After the Dragonfly drone lands on Titan's surface, it's going to whiz around like a sort of double helicopter. It's going to have eight propellers, three feet wide. Since there's weak gravity, that's more than enough to give the drone good cruising speed. It'll be able to fly about two miles straight up and take off and land vertically, like a regular helicopter. The main problem with the whole thing is the drone's batteries. Scientists invented a generator that converts thermal radiation energy into electrical energy, whatever that means. One battery charge should be enough for several hours of continuous flight. The Dragonfly is going to be carrying a lot of research equipment, so it's not like those drones people fly in the park on a Sunday. 
it's going to weigh about as much as three ostriches. It's going to have two drills, a bunch of sensors, a spectro thing to find out what chemicals are lying around, and it's also going to have its own weather channel with a ton of instruments to measure temperature and clouds and stuff. And like any gadget nowadays, it has a camera on it. Get ready for some beautiful pics. At a distance of 640 light years from the sun, scientists discovered planet WASP 76b, where it rains iron. The planet is very close to its sun and always turned to it in the same side. The term is tidally locked. The temperature on the sunny side is so high that metals melt and evaporate there. The other half of the planet is cool enough so that metals condense again and fall down as rain. Speaking of tidal locks, our moon is the same way. There's no dark side to our satellite, it's just always turned to us with one side. When the moon happens to be in between the Earth and the sun, what we call its dark side becomes brightly lit. We just can't see it from our planet. Hmm, figures. A recent study claims that the moon has a tail. And every month, it wraps around our planet like a scarf. A slender tail made up of millions of atoms of sodium follows Earth's natural satellite. And our planet regularly travels directly through it. Meteor strikes blast these sodium atoms out of the moon's surface and further into space. You won't believe it, but the moon seems to be shrinking. Earth's natural satellite is now 150 feet smaller than it used to be hundreds of millions of years ago. The reason for this phenomenon might be the cooling of the moon's insides. It could also explain the quakes shaking the surface of our planet's natural satellite. Astronomers have recently found out that Mars is seismically active. Mars quakes occur there on a regular basis. For several days every month, the moon remains between the sun and our planet. That's when Earth's gravity picks up that sodium tail. Our planet drags it into a long stripe that wraps around its atmosphere. This lunar tail is totally harmless. It's also invisible to the human eye, 50 times dimmer than what you can perceive. But on those rare days, high-powered telescopes can spot its faint yellowish glow in the sky. The tail looks like a gleaming spot that's five times the moon's full diameter. Turns out there are plenty of planets in the universe, and even in the Milky Way galaxy, that have liquid or frozen water on them. The closest one is within our solar system. It's Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Scientists are almost sure that underneath its frozen surface, there's an actual ocean of water. But it's too soon to be hyped about possible life on such planets. Liquid water is only one of many things that have to come together for life to appear on a planet. A star in the galaxy GSN 069 is likely to turn into a planet the size of Jupiter in the next trillion years. It might happen because of the star's regular encounters with a black hole. First, astronomers noticed unusual X-ray bursts that were strangely bright. They went off every nine hours. After studying this phenomenon for some time, the scientists realized it was a star moving in a unique orbit around a black hole. The dazzling flashes? It was the material getting slurped off the star's surface by the black hole. It turned out that over millions of years, the black hole had already transformed the red giant into a white dwarf. And the process isn't going to stop whatsoever. Astronomers have found some traces of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. On our planet, this gas, colorless and flammable, is often found where microbes live. No wonder a new theory suggests that there might be life on Venus. But even if there was some life on the evening star, it could have only appeared in its atmosphere. Probably no living organism would be able to survive the planet's extreme environment. Venus's surface is extremely dry, there's no liquid water on the planet, and the pressure there is 90 times greater than that on Earth's surface. The temperatures often rise higher than 900 degrees. That's hot enough to melt some metals. As for vacations there, I'll pass. In fact, there's a place millions of light years away where there's a whole floating space cloud made entirely of water. There's so much of it that we could fill all our oceans 140 trillion times over. Slightly more than what we need. Water on Earth is actually a puzzle shrouded in mystery and covered with riddles. The most popular theory is that it was brought to our planet by icy comets and asteroids that left behind not only mighty craters, but the liquid substance thanks to which we can now thrive. 
But in space, there's a whole lot of organic matter, and under specific conditions, it could yield so much water, it would be enough to fill our oceans thousands of times over. Researchers conducted an experiment in which they heated this organic matter and obtained clear water and oil. If this is confirmed in future studies, it could mean that even oil appeared on Earth not only thanks to fossilized remains of living beings, but came from outer space as well. And yet, there might just be about 6 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone. The latest data has shown that every fifth sun-like star can have at least one planet in its habitable zone. And not just any planet, mind you. It has a rocky core and surface, and it's of comparable size to the Earth. Being inside the habitable zone of its star, such a planet would have high chances of becoming home to living creatures. Microbes, at least. And if there are billions of these planets in our galaxy, you could safely say that at least one of them is not only habitable, but inhabited already. And now, multiply this by the number of galaxies in the universe, also considering that many of them are much bigger than the Milky Way. This gives us billions upon billions of sun-like stars and Earth-like planets, and some of them are surely more like ours than others. And get this, we might be able to walk upright because of supernova explosions. About 2.5 million years ago, a supernova sent cosmic rays to our planet. They triggered a series of electrical storms in the Earth's atmosphere, which turned into thunderstorms. Those in turn caused wildfires in Northeast Africa, where our earlier ancestors lived. Fires turned the forest area into a savanna, the atmospheric pressure changed, and our ancestors had to stand on two legs to survive. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.